yet. Okay, good. Um, I'm coming up as gender, Jennifer Funderburg, but um, Jennifer Funderburg, excuse me. But um, but yes, this is Beth. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. But I want to give sort of like a context of this, so the people that are listening know whether or not they're not there, they're at the right place. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, some basics. So you may want to multitask if your background is pretty extensive in either program evaluation or um, in the data collection in integrated care. Um, but there may be some tidbits and things. Um, but please know I'll send out all of the slides as well as um, an actual Word document with a lot more detail on some measured domains and information later on. Um, so this is really geared towards individuals that really want to get an overview and kind of figure out how to think through doing um, and starting up a program evaluation on their integrated care projects, projects and um, just some, some ideas and um, things to think through. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, as you can see, we're going to cover a little bit about program evaluation, just some basics, but also give it its context. Um, and describing in the second ob learning objective um, differences between program evaluation and why is it and how is it different from quality improvements and um, uh, actual scientific research. Um, and then we'll go ahead and actually look at the meat, which is pretty much laying out and executing evaluation. There's going to be a little bit of overlap you'll see with implementation, um, but one of the things that I learned as a, <laughs> in my decade of doing program evaluation is that most of the time when you're thinking through an evaluation, it really helps the organization that you're working with or your own organization to fine tune what exactly is going on with their intervention. So you're going to find a little bit of overlap there, and I'll try to try to clarify where one is implementation versus um, evaluation. So let's get started. Okay. So um, I found that there's probably about 30 different definitions for just about everything out there. So I ended up in trying to help my graduate students understand what is program evaluation and why is there a separate course if they've had all these research methodology. But one of the things that probably comes down to, you know, basically in short, program evaluation is really designed um, to figure out whether or not a program is doing what it was supposed to be doing and to what extent it's doing it. Um, basically, if you're looking at a program evaluation, you're looking at a very finite period of time and a very specific program in which it's your job to figure out pretty quickly whether or not it's a good or bad program or to what degree it's a good or bad program. And a lot of times you'll get stuck in this idea that when you figure out what it is you want to measure, it starts to highlight some concerns with the program itself. So we talk about with program evaluation, is it achieving its goals? One of the things that we find is that our job as program evaluators is to help an organization figure out whether or not they're looking at the right goals. So let me very simple example. So in the 1960s, this very powerful tool called behavior modification was being used more and more. And two of my um, former mentors were called into this outrageously ridiculous out of control classroom and the teacher said our math scores are terrible and look my kids are running around like crazy can you use this new tool of, pro of, uh, of uh, um, behavior modification and help my kids sit down and pay attention so of course these two budding graduate student behavior modifying you know behavior analysts came up with this program and they got all these kids with butts and seats and sure enough the kids looked beautiful. They were paying attention. The teacher was thrilled. All was lovely. And sure enough, because we were also measuring, they were also measuring the goal of whether or not the math scores mm, improved, they found nothing. So a lot of times as program evaluators, we need to make sure that our actual goals of our program are achieved, but whether or not they're in line with other things that are going on. So we're going to talk about those two components today um, in process and outcomes measures. So if you're looking for more of an official definition, um, I personally like this one. And I think probably the most exciting piece to me is probably that second word is sense making. This to me really highlights the difference between program evaluation and scientific research. Let me break this definition down. Um, what this evaluation textbook really describes, this idea that in evaluation questions, we have to look at whether or not we're making sense of programs whether or not we're actually systematically collecting data, there's how we're cousins with science, 
But also our job is also to describe and explain what's happening in those programs. And when you're looking at sense making, it really comes down to, and this keyword here is that one of the things that we do apply in sense making is a value. Um, so at the end of a program evaluation, it's my job in sense making to be told, okay, this all this data is great, but now, Dr. Nolan, can you please tell me thumbs up, thumbs down? Should I or should I not have this program in my organization? As a scientist, I would be appalled and stumble at a response. But as a program evaluator, I expect that. And that's one of the major differences in what it is we're expected to do with program evaluation. There's a couple of, unfortunately, pulls along those ways when it comes to capacity. So let's think about, just in general, what is the purpose of evaluation so you can get this context that we're talking about? I'm going to leave this list for you in the slides, but I'm not going to obviously read through it. These are the basic six purposes of evaluation, and it's pretty much summed up in the first one. To what extent is your program meeting its objectives? But as you'll see later on as you're doing your sort of your program planning, are your objectives actually addressing the problem at hand? A lot of those are measures that we can take in evaluation to see if you're headed in the right direction. So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. So when we're comparing things like scientific research or actual studies, there's obviously a lot of similarities, like, yes, scientific program evaluation uses the scientific method. Um, we do use statistics, but many times I don't have the luxury of getting a big enough N or big enough number of people in my practices to reach statistical um, significance. So a lot of times I may use statistics, but I may not. In science, that's not going to be the case. Even when you're talking about qualitative research and scientific research, qualitative research even itself has a very systematic approach in which the data is analyzed. But one of the things that I talk with to my students and as well as my community members is that in program evaluation, it's my job to also be responsible for the dollars that I'm stealing from the patients you're providing care to. So every dollar I use or that you will use to evaluate your programs is a dollar or time you're not giving back to your patients. So there's a very important balance here that has to happen in program evaluation that we don't necessarily have to look at quite that specifically in science. Um, what I kind of bring this down to, and, and this is unfortunately has a very negative connotation, but in program evaluation, a lot of times I'm going to look at data that is good enough. Is my data and the story it's telling me good enough to tell me whether or not we're headed in the right direction? The difference is pretty much highlighted, as ridiculous as it sounds. In science, if someone said, okay, you did a great study on here on 13-year-old boys, will it work on 14-year-old boys? And a good scientist will say, well, it worked beautifully on 13-year-old boys. We really need to explore whether or not it would work on 14-year-old boys. They can be a little bit different at that age. That's a great, but my hypothesis is it probably would. Program evaluator would smile and say, yeah, I think you're probably pretty safe. Go ahead and give it a try with your 14-year-old boys. Maybe take a few more measures to make sure it is still working with them. But that's the idea of this, this idea with program evaluation is a lot of times we have to look at the value of the information and the data collected and whether or not it's adding that much more value. So it's kind of a return on investment issue. Um, traditionally, science doesn't have to deal with this, although more and more they are. Um, and it's probably that last piece is about probabilities versus assessments. In program evaluation, I am asked to apply a value to a program. In scientific research, it comes up with this idea, the methods yield only probabilities, probabilities of whether or not something is likely to have an effect. A little bit more briefly, how is program evaluation different from CQI or continuous quality improvement? Uh, it pretty much is summed up in the bottom line. Program evaluation should only be a time-limited series of measures in which you're not continuously measuring the effects of your program forever and ever. A good program is actually going to, or program managers are going to choose evidence-based practices already. And so when they're choosing those evidence-based practices, there's a faith on the scientific community that that's already been established. And I need to make sure if I'm doing it well at first and that I'm getting the results that are equivalent to what science has already proven 
and then I can let it go and really focus on the delivery of that program. With CQI, it is a little bit more problem and process focused. We're trying to figure out how to continuously improve our processes. Very different beasts, but again, both using sort of a scientific method or a systematic approach like the plan, do, study, act cycle. So that gives a little bit of, complex, a little bit of context. Um, probably the best little last piece on just overall this idea of program evaluation is really designed to assess value is um, Scriven's uh, sort of quote on this idea that anything can be evaluated, including evaluation. But in science, we, do, we, da we gather data, but with program evaluation, we provide clarification, we provide verification, and then at the end, we determine whether or not it's something that we may be looking at in terms of thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, Michael Scriven is actually the person who coined the terms formative evaluation and summative evaluation. So those are basically where we're headed into. All right, I'm going to pause for a second. That was just an overview to give people kind of a context of what is program evaluation as words. Has any questions come up that um, on that first section? All righty. I'm assuming I'm still on. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, question, no questions at this point, Beth. Okay. So, um, Basic evaluation strategies come pretty much in two forms, your formative evaluation and your summative evaluation. So we're talking about things like a formative evaluation. This is determining whether or not in the beginning of a program, in the formative stage of, an, of a program, you have what you need, you're doing what you need, you're making the choices that you need. A summative evaluation is after a program has begun, and starts to look at some either early term outcomes or later term outcomes such as the impact. So I'm a very visual learner, so I like to put that in the context of a visual display of where things sort of land. Um, in the context of a lot of your work with integrated care, needs assessment are not necessarily part of the plan for a lot of you, so I sort of left that off. Um, needs assessments in a, in a nutshell are looking at things like um, the social conditions surrounding a program, whether or not there is a need for the services, and that's pretty much been well established by public health and surveillance studies. It kind of hangs out there. Um, so you can see here that for formative evaluation, it sort of cuts across the beginning of a program, but you can see where summative evaluation, as the word sounds like, sum, looks at as people are starting to encounter the effects of an intervention, what sort of outcomes and then eventually the impacts of a program start to happen. Now, we can use this start and, and end points lightly. Um, starting is pretty clear, but ending could be where it is that the program is fully implemented, it's up and running, it's where it is you as a practice think it needs to be, um, and then you can continue a little bit of your measures on, and that's that dotted line there looking at the sort of the outcomes and, and impact evaluation. A lot of times you'll hear, um, the words uh, formative evaluation, summative evaluation used with process and outcomes evaluation. But they are a little bit different here. As you can see, a formative evaluation can actually begin before the start of a program. But now let's make it even more confusing. And of course, all those powers that be and they're putting together a program evaluation decided to also use the words process measures and outcomes measures. Therein lies the need for, you know, my colors and my visuals here. Process measures are literally those measures in which we can take a look at what's happening, what processes are, are, are being executed. Are we doing what we said we're being, that we're supposed to be doing? Um, outcomes measures look at what is it you hope to have happen. So let's put that a little bit more of a definition here so you guys have those. So the programs that are being assessed during the development or early intervention are your formative stages. And for your summative, you're talking about when after it's begun. Um, mostly, though, what we're going to be looking at today is the summative side of things, and it's going to help you decide what in your programs need to be improved, what isn't working, and then what needs to be continued, what is working for your, for your patients. When we're looking at process evaluations, these, in, in the context of the execution of an intervention, it helps you guys find out where your program is actually starting to have an impact on your outcomes. So a lot of times you can see how an outcomes measure could be taken, and it seems like that's the way to go. 
are my patients showing improvements? But what are the sorts of things that you see your patients doing, even if you execute the most beautiful program in the world? Take a diet program. You could have the most amazing exercise regimen, education, follow-up, and some of your patients may never lose weight. Does that mean your program is horribly flawed and needs to be changed? If we don't have process measures to tell us why we're getting our outcomes measures, we could be in a little bit of trouble. So a lot of intervention programs with program evaluations end up having um, either the flawed methodology where they only use outcomes measures. Um, on the other hand, a lot of our intervention programs for implementation of integrated care are very, very heavy on the process measures, and we never really get to the outcomes measures. So we're going to talk about both of those there today. So it comes out of this idea that outcomes tell you what happened, but processes, process evaluations and process measures tell you why they may have happened. Pretty critical piece for all of this. So in a nutshell, what is it that, oops, I'm getting, excuse me one second, okay. So when we're talking about process evaluations, this is sort of what it is we measure to try to get at that why. Um, it's things such as like the number of participations you're reach, participants you're reaching. These are like the, the attendance, um, uh, whether or not you're actually doing what it is you thought you were doing, your program activity components. And underneath here is a series of ways that we sort of gather that data. Uh, it's very, very organic and usually very tailored and specific to the sites. But basically in your process measures, you should be looking at, is the program being delivered as promised and is it functioning as it's intended? Outcomes measures, by contrast, are looking at so like the benefits or when you do those processes, what is it that you're actually getting? There's three sorts of areas in which you look at your outcomes measures. The first of which is your short-term outcomes. So thinking now very specifically to the context of integrated care, these are things that are happening, let's say, on the practice level, um, to or with the patients, um, by providers, within maybe the first two weeks of care. These are the initial contacts or initially in the program, and it's really starting to look at for outcomes, what sort of knowledge is happening, what sort of skills do I see people attaining very early on. This is a little bit different from the first week programs. You can see there's not a whole lot going on there. I'm going to flip back up to show you kind of the difference here. If you're talking about process evaluations. You can see how those initial on-the-ground practice activities are going to be much more heavy in your process evaluation measures. The next area that you need to look at for program evaluation measures in integrated care is your media, intermediate terms. These are like your medium. Um, after your program has been going for a little bit, are you starting to see the behaviors you want? Very different question from what is it that you're actually seeing. So on each one of these, you'll notice there's what is it you want and what is it you actually see. This can really help, these sorts of questions can help you really sort of determine are my measures sensitive enough to detect the things that I think are going to happen and hopefully also be sensitive enough to detect the things that I really hope will happen. Um, finally, long-term outcomes. As the program's going, as your patients are in longer, what are the sorts of maintained behaviors you hope to see? What sort of status changes do you hope that they will achieve? And what does it look like? How is it that we can measure if someone is actually getting the fullest extent of our program? What will that patient look like? Those sorts of questions can help you in that planning of looking at this. This time frame, again, is not very specific, in my opinion, to anything other than integrated care. Obviously, there's, there's other programs that are very specific, a lot of behavioral and uh, physical health interventions. Um, but when you're talking about, let's say, a completely different program evaluation, like a, a policy um, for policing, you're going to be looking at a much greater amount of time, let's say law. Um, these numbers would be completely changed. So this is a very tailored slide to integrated care. So has anybody recognized sort of these special words here? I'm hoping if people have actually thought through or maybe even had to do the arduous uh, job of getting grants to fund your integrated care efforts, you start to recognize some of these terms in the overlap. So in short-term, medium, and long-term outcomes, we start to delve into another tool that we use in evaluation quite a bit, which is the logic model. So we'll talk about that in a second. We'll actually go right into that. There in your lies your overlap 
with implementation planning. They should go hand in hand. But before we leave this basic overview of program evaluation, I want to go ahead and cover basic four considerations. This is going to be something that you're going to think about much farther on down the line if you haven't already started planning your evaluations. Looking at when you're thinking about what it is you want to measure, these sorts of items, these four considerations are something to take in. This. So, for example, first of all, prioritizing your outcomes. When you've got this list of all these short, medium, and long-term outcomes that are possible, all the patient measures, all the return on investments, all the labs that may be done, all the different things that you could measure, really looking at what is your situation? How much money do you have? How much time? How much access to good quality data collection do you have? How much additional in-kind resources do you have? Um, none, of these, none of these considerations um, or none of these choices for what outcomes you choose can be done outside of that sort of domain of where it is you're, oper you're putting these together. Um, second of all, operate, operationalizing your measures. This has to do with making sure you're actually measuring the right thing and it's specific enough. So, for example, um, if we take a part of definition of, let's say, prevalence of psychiatric, or, um, uh, psychotic symptoms, sounds very concrete to some individuals, or even specific diagnoses, but it can get really, really gray when you're starting to talk about measuring outcomes and trying to detect differences and improvements in your patients. So if you think about just that alone, for a lot of the mental health um, diagnoses out there, there's a lot of different behaviors that you might see. And there's also the degrees to which each of those different behaviors actually happen. So as you're looking at the measures and, and pulling things up from the literature, looking at the context and how they've actually defined these measures is a really good consideration for your team to be looking at. Um, and finally, the last two, consulting the literature for other things that have been measured. There's absolutely nothing, nothing out there, in my opinion, at this point with integrated care that a primary care office should be inventing. You don't have the time, the resources, um, or necessarily the need to be creating your own measures. Um, but of course, when you're looking at the literature, it's scientific literature. Making sure that checking in with the SAMHSA website and seeing what sort of measures that, um, that they recommend, there's quite a few measures out there that are specifically designed for the looking at science rather than program evaluation. So consulting the literature is a great place to go, um, you know, citing and taking liberally uh, is, is a pretty good way to go um, for being totally efficient. But the other side of that is, of course, measuring the multiple d dimensions of a variable. So thinking of that, that elephant, the tail, the leg, the trunk, what sorts of topographies are you looking at? What things do you care about, and are you actually measuring things in a variety of ways? What does depression look like, and how does it manifest itself for your patients is pretty important to think about when you're looking at and choosing outcomes measures. So. We'll go ahead, and I'm going to end at the end of today with a series of examples of things that I have found to be very helpful for my practices to measure, so we'll be able to kind of dig down a little deeper in these. All right. The bottom line is, <laughs> though, be really careful what it is you measure. Um, how many times you measure it, how many times you're actually looking at the, the same thing again and again. We're talking about, you know, retest, testing and retesting. Are your measures going to be um, controlling for things like validity and reliability? All of these things should be things you're looking at in the literature and, and will be necessary to be responsible for. But the nice thing about that is a lot of the websites, such as the SAMHSA website, help break those down for you so you're not stuck either looking in the wrong place or measuring something that really isn't in line with what you're doing. All right. There's the academic boring portion of this talk. Okay, so for those of you that already knew a lot about program evaluation, here's your heads up. You can come on back in and, and, and put the email aside. So let's go on to the meat. So where do you begin? Okay, evaluation is extremely tailored. When you're starting this, I already kind of spoke to a little bit about this. In your, where is it that your practice is, first of all, in your own integrated care journey? So when you're looking at what it is you want to measure, how far down the line are you looking? So if you recall, early on, um, what sort of processes have you already begun? What processes are actually working in that, 
seem to have a lot of the bugs figured out. Um, we're going to actually go through and put together a process map, and so you have some examples of how to think through where it is you may be able to find your measures, which will really tell you in that exercise where sort of you are and where it is your, your group will have the conversation to be thinking about where it is you want to go. If you're very, very early in your integration journey as practice, it may be that you want to look at more of a formative evaluation approach, looking to see really what is your patient population with regard to your needs. Um, I think for most of you guys, if you're here, you're probably much farther down the line in what it is you're trying to do and have already come across some bumps and are trying to figure out what measures you can take um, such that you'll be able to know what it is you want to go. So given where you are, if you've had that conversation, the second bit of the questions to be asking as a group, as your team, is what is it you really want to know? So there's a lot of different things when you're conducting evaluation, a lot of questions that you could be asking, and literally hundreds of measures that you could be taking. But when you're talking about your own particular practice and where it is you want to go, really need to be quite selective about what it is, what problems you're encountering, and therefore that sort of dictates what it is you want to measure. And then again, this kind of comes down to that capacity. What sorts of resources do you have? Um, I know one of the practices I worked with had um, one of their, uh, you know, one of their baby docs, one of their new um, residents, also had an MBA with an emphasis on organizational change. Talk about a score. This guy really had a very different perspective and was very excited to be using some of his older skills before he went to med school. So looking at who is on your team um, and looking at the fact that while data is important, you still have to run your practice. So what is it we have? Monetary, in-kind, individual skills, but also desire. Program evaluation on top of running integrated care is a lot of, um, is, is very time consuming. So this comes back, brings you popping back right up to that middle question is what is it you really need to know? And that's going to be important for tailoring your intervention. That's sort of like your first step as a team. So then where do you go from there? You've begun the conversation. You do realize you do want to measure some things. So the first thing we need to probably do is think about building a logic model. Now, my assumption is that quite a few are quite familiar with logic models, but I want to just say one quick little bit about what exactly a logic model is such that we can all get on the same page. There are dozens and dozens of different forms of logic models out there. But basically, a logic model is simply a picture of your practice and what it is you want to do with regard to integrated care. It first starts off over there on the other situation side. It's very logical. It's got a flow. What is the problem that your patients are facing? So in other words, what brought you to the idea that you have to do integrated care? And then furthermore, you've got to figure out how to measure it. What problems are your, are your practice facing, but mainly your patients facing? So in other words, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, the second thing input there is what is it that you need to have in place in order to, now head to the green, do what it is you need to do as a practice so you can start to address that problem back there in the blue situation. After you start doing those activities, so it's the things you do on a daily basis with your patients, what is it that happens to them? In the short term, we're talking a lot about process measures. Um, are we screening everyone that should be screened? Are we screening them properly? Are we screening them regularly enough? Did they come? Did they engage with us? Um, are they returning? How many follow-up calls are we making? All these sorts of process measures are very much the short-term picture of where you're trying to head. The next level is pretty much starting in your outcomes measures, looking at sort of behavior change. Under here it's listed as action. These are the medium-term results here, and these are pretty much where the, you know, everything starts to really happen. Are you seeing some behavior change with your patients? And then finally, the long, what long-term impacts are you having to change the social condition of everyone in your practice, not just on the individual patient level, but overall, what are your quality measures looking like? How much more adherent are you to some of the heinous and quality measures that are happening for your, for your patients as an entire practice. Once you have that, you can start to build your, your program evaluation right off of this pink part. So this is where the overlap, I've yet talked even, I'm only in step one, but I have not yet even talked about program evaluation. 
this first step is really just thinking about what it is you have as a practice. So take a look at this. These are all the different things you can start to fill this in. So when you're looking at trying to figure out what it is your practice is doing, it's an incredible exercise to figure out what it is you have and whether or not they're in line. So think back for a minute about the butts and seats example I gave. The intervention right there under activities would have been a behavior modification program to get children to get their butts to sit down. But if your situation at the beginning had to do with poor math skills and poor math scores, it kind of helps you recognize that maybe some of the activities we're doing aren't in line with the problem we've got and the long-term goals we hope to achieve. I'm going to stop there with regard to logic models, um, but I would highly advise, highly advise if anyone is going to go about doing a program evaluation, this has to be your first step. What is it that you're doing and what is it you hope to achieve and are those goals in line? And the best tool I've seen that helps my communities that are unfamiliar with logic models is the Wisconsin uh, University of Wisconsin Extension Office. I left the, um, the link down there at the bottom, and of course I'll send these slides out to everyone. It is a fabulous website. Um, it has how to build logic models, how to, how to have that conversation with your team, and, um, and getting them, getting to know your program first. So with regard to getting to know your program first, with regard to integrated care, as we go ahead and dive right in to designing your program evaluation, that's generally where I'm brought in. Brought in to help someone design what measures it is that they want to select. But a lot of times when I start measuring things that are in line with the goals that they think they have, and an organization has failed to really sit down and think through what it is they're doing, their activities, I generally find that we miss something. So even though this seems very, very basic of a task, I will tell you, in my integrated care um, practice, probably the biggest example of this, of missing something, is um, I had a fabulous um, behavioral health center that was integrating and opening up uh, primary care practice within their, behavioral health, their community behavioral health center. And one of the things that, of course, we are looking at is tracking, tracking prescription um, medications and tracking changes and whether or not these scripts are actually being delivered and so forth. So when I went in to go ahead and ask the folks, okay, so tell me a little bit about how it is that we can collect data, where the opportunities to collect data with regard to prescription drugs. And so they brought me into their newly minted, beautiful, shiny new clinic, turned on the EMR, and tried to give an example of how it is that they print out and then can track their prescription changes. And sure enough, the computer with the EMR on it would not link up or speak to the printer. Six months delay later, we opened the primary care practice in the behavioral health center and I could track prescriptions. What the program evaluation, starting off with a logic model, does for you, it allows you, and take a look under inputs, to identify all critical staff members that could possibly be involved in all of your activities. And sure enough, on their logic model and their thinking, they didn't have a logic model, Nowhere was the IT individual involved in any of their planning. That therein lied our six-month delay. So it is really critical, and while it can seem kind of silly, it's pretty important. But one of the most exciting things, as we're talking about with program evaluation, comes from looking at these outcomes. But if our outcomes with our process measures don't match up with our activities, we're going to be in a lot of trouble when we try to try to pull things together. So I'm going to first help you guys in terms of deciding what outcomes you need to track. Let's take a look at how it is you actually build the activities that you're doing in a very systematic way. This is part of what a program evaluator has to do, and this is what you guys can do as well if you're not working with a program evaluator. So in order to identify those activities in your logic model, which will therefore build all the different measures you want to take based on your goals, First, look at what is the integrated practice process in your particular practice. So many of you live in these practices. This right here is a very basic detail of how your patients run through your own practices. Pretty generic. But you guys, since you guys live in these practices, a lot of what you're seeing is things from behind the desk and behind the door and behind the computer screen. 
So if, to really think through your own processes, you're going to have to actually think about things from the other side of your check-in desk from the patient's point of view. Because it's amazing how many times we go through these exercises, um, we're very stuck on what processes happen on our side and not thinking about what processes happen to the, to the patient. So go ahead, you guys, for just a second, try this. Close your eyes. Walk into your practice as a patient. And if you're incredibly visual, you're going to have to walk into your own PCP's office in order to do this. What is it that your patients encounter first? What piece of paper do they get? What tablet do they get? What information do they get when they walk in the door? Or maybe even, what information did they get before they hit your door, even before check-in? These are the types of thoughts and activities that you're going to go through to identify potential opportunities to collect your data. What piece of paper is handed to your patients and in what form is it entered into your electronic health record? Now, as you fill this out, you're going to do that same exact exercise, but looking at it from your side of the desk. Thinking through check-in, okay, after I hand my, my patients or they check in the computer screen or they sign in and fill out a form, where is it that that paper goes? What form does it happen in? Um, a great example of this was when I was working with a community mental health um, county level organization and they said all of their data is electronic. You'll be able to mine everything, Beth. You're going to love it. And I said, great. I'm so excited. Boy, it seems pretty advanced. So I went and I said, well, let me see. And every single file on every single person that they served in their county was, in fact, electronic in PDF form in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of files on their computers. Functionally, from an evaluation standpoint, I thought I was going to cry. PDFs are not electronic, and you can't aggregate data from that without a lot of time. So these are the things that helping you identify all the activities in your practice. After you get through this, hopefully you'll have something a little bit like this. What is your actual process flow that your patients, and therefore you, and all your different providers go through? You can start to see how each different staff members and it may be that you don't have RNs. It may be that your RNs are your NPs and they're your PCPs. It may be that you have medical assistance. But either way, looking at the way that your process flows, the cool thing about this is then you can check it. You start to build this idea of what happens and, therefore, where's the data opportunities. But then you can go back and say, ah, do my front desk staff agree? Do my MAs, my LPNs? What sort of link do I have with my behavioral health providers? Um, what about my IT staff? What about my pharmacists, medical record staff? Whoever it is that may fall into your process to the point where your patients leave and therefore loop back around to check in at the next appointment will give you a much better opportunity to start identifying all your points of data collection and so forth. So forth. All right, so I'm going to pause. Looking at what seems like a very, I'm going to go back up, a very simple, silly process of figuring out what it is you think you already know, you can see how all the detail starts to identify ways in which you may be able to find existing opportunities of data. But again, just like my example of the Community Mental Health County Level Agency, how it is that you run your practice will affect the quality of the data that you're able to, fit to, to use, how easy it is to collect, and then eventually how much you're going to be able to spend the time to really use that data. This is, again, only step two, but this helps you start to clarify your process measures and your outcomes measures. Even if this is not as simple as your practice is, even the most complex processes, once they're mapped out and everybody that's involved and all the different agencies are checked and, and brought into it, you can start to identify tons of opportunities where existing data already exists, or existing data already exists. Very redundant. So here's an example of a process flow we created for individuals who call 911, 911 and go through the system. 
So each star indicates an opportunity where data already existed that we could pull to help identify, you know, how things were going in the whole process. So let's say you're looking at your own practice, and in your practice, it's not a fully integrated practice, but yet you're partnering with or co-located with a behavioral health organization. This becomes a much more complex process flow. And it's going to be two different organizations that you're going to have to have on one single process flow such that you can start to see what happens to your own patients. All right. After you've got your outcomes, this is where you go back and check. You go back again to your logic model. Now, remember, what we've done so far is just identify your activities and start to see whether or not there's opportunities for data collection. But the risk if we just use this and do not look at our logic model, what we have is we may say, ah, there's lots of points in which I can collect data. But sometimes it's not the data that's in line with what we're looking at in our logic model that our outcome, our goals. So it's really important to make sure you take a look at this and you start to build your measures both from what it is you hope to achieve in your program, your logic model, and what it is your opportunities are and your processes to collect data to then learn about what's happening with those outcomes. So at that point, take this logic model and start to identify your measures. Let me do a time check here. We are headed into the last few minutes. So what we do in step three is take a look at this in three different measure domains. You've got your patient, practice, and system level domains. Again, this is a nice framework to make sure that when you're looking at your logic model plus your process flow, that you've got everything you need. So your patient level measures, you can start to look at things such as process measures like screening and assessment, the number of patients screened, as well as, let's say, their scores, but also looking at treatment adherence and also then your actual treatment outcomes at the patient level. Most providers have a pretty good idea as any single patient walks into the room what's going on. But another important level to look at to sort of gauge things is your practice level. So the difference here between practice level and, and provider, I'm sorry, patient level measures are the idea of like, um, think of a car. So if your job was to get to DC, there's two different types of measures you're going to need. The first one is the data you get to know whether or not you're driving the car well and correctly. The speedometer, how fast the, the trees are going by on the side of the road, whether or not you're in the lines, but also then, you could end up in Atlanta rather than D.C. Your practice level measures give you an idea to make sure your practice as a whole is actually going in the right direction for all of your patients. We can get really lost without sort of these benchmarks and these comparisons. These are some of the ideas for the measure domains of the practice level. And then finally, you've got your system level. These ones become a little bit more expensive and a little bit more labor intensive. Your system level pieces have to do a little bit more with that higher level. Is my program actually having a greater effect such that it could actually be justified, let's say, to be financed by a partnership with an insurance company? So in your step four, you start to then identify all the different scales. What I'm going to do is I have literally a list of all different types of measures that can be used, the different scales, and ways that you can start to collect some of these patient provider or practice level and system level measures across your entire process. I want to highlight though here this idea that not getting stuck at the practice level in your aggregate patient screening. You could literally spend all of your time and money on dozens and dozens and dozens of aggregate patient information that may or might not be helpful. This is where it's going to be really important to head back to your process and make sure that as a community or as a, as a practice, you're deciding what it is that's important and looking to see where your problems are and the questions that you have. And finally, with your systems levels measures, these are really looking at whether or not there is someone already that's collecting this or if you have a really advanced, wonderful EMR that can also act as a data repository that you can just cull data from. A lot of times partnerships with your major, with the insurance providers that are providing, let's say, you know, even 40 to 50 percent of your practice, a lot of times they'll be willing to partner with you and pull a lot of this data for you. This really gives up to a high level of looking at the efficacy of your program. And finally, going back to check. 
Again, you haven't collected one single piece of data. But in step five, you really need to go back and check to make sure that each one of the data pieces that you're going to collect and spend time and energy doing are relevant to the different points in your process and make sure that they're actually answering the questions that you need. So I'll leave it in the last five minutes, ooh, four minutes, for any questions that people might have. But knowing I will go ahead and feel free to email me, but I will go ahead and send out a wonderfully detailed matrix of a lot of these different measures and also some of these slides. You're able to do these steps yourselves in, in terms of your own practice. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Nolan. Um, we At this point, we have just a couple minutes left for any questions. Um, if you do have a question, remember in your panel on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a little box where you can type those questions in. As Dr. Nolan mentioned, you can also email her at nolanbeth at gmail.com, and she can answer your, your questions directly. Or if you'd like to raise your hand and verbally ask that question, I can monitor that as well. So let's just give a minute to see if anyone would like to submit a question. Um, we don't have a question, but we do have a thank you. Dr. Nolan, very concise and informative. Um, thank, and thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you so much. So, feel free to give me a holler if there's anything I can do. Very good. Um, and so thanks to Dr. Nolan and thank you, Dr. Palaha. Again, we'd like to encourage everyone, if you haven't already registered for the annual CFHA meeting um, this October, in Portland, Oregon, we highly encourage you to do so. We have a great uh, a great program, and again, there will be uh, many, many um, program evaluation and research sessions in the breakout sessions for the conference, so we'd love for you all to attend. Thanks so much, and take care, everyone. Thank you.